Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Docker webinar, an introduction to containers and container orchestrators. Before we get started, I want to explain how you can participate. For this webinar, you must join the audio through your computer speaker system. To do this, please go to the audio panel and click on the button marked Computer Audio. Today's session is hosted by Oliver Pomeroy, who is a technical solution engineer here at Docker. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can enter them into the questions panel and one of our Docker experts will respond. Please know this session is being recorded and you will receive a copy via email in about 48 hours. That's the key items I wanted to cover. I am now going to hand over to Oliver. The introduction to containers, container orchestrators, and the Docker Enterprise container platform. Okay, so we'll start off just kind of by looking at the application landscape that most enterprises today are, are facing. Um, and that landscape is starting to become really kind of the matrix from hell. And what I mean by that, the amount of applications that enterprises are being asked to deploy is growing. Right. We know software is eating the world. We know that more and more applications are being asked or being developed and being deployed inside of enterprises. And so if you kind of looked at this as a graph on the vertical axis here, the types of applications that people are deploying are growing, growing upwards. Especially as we start to move into microservices, cloud native applications, maybe functions as a service, the more and more sub components of a particular application is also growing. So not, not only are enterprises being asked to deploy more applications than ever before, they're being asked to deploy more components of each application. And then on, on the horizontal axis of, of this kind of graph, and we're often finding enterprises are being asked to deploy their applications to more and more places. Traditionally, it was, well, deploy in our data center and, and maybe our, our DR data center. But now we're finding enterprises are being asked to deploy in a variety of different physical locations, so data centers, public clouds, private clouds, as well as a lot of different types of devices as well. It could be edge devices, could be end user devices. There's kind of a whole remit of, of places where software is being deployed where people previously haven't had to worry about getting software to. So we kind of end up in this matrix. Enterprises are being asked to deploy more and more applications and they're being asked to deploy them in, in more and more places. So the question then becomes, how can we start to standardize our applications? How can we start to standardize our application deployment processes? And how can we start to standardize our devices so we don't have to worry about packaging all these different things for all these different places? And that's exactly where Docker comes in that's exactly where containers come in. Um, now, the, the analogy works quite well here with shipping containers. And, and what I mean by this is, if you think of a traditional shipping container, uh, prior to this, people, when they wanted to transport goods around the world, um, there was kind of no real way or, or standard unit to, to ship goods. This shipping container came in, and all of a sudden, people could build infrastructure around it. If you wanted to transport, I don't know, a thousand bananas or you wanted to transport a car, you didn't have to create new ships, cranes, trains, etc., to carry those goods. That one shipping container became a standard packaging format for you to move goods around. Um, so therefore, all you have to do is design the processes once to move that particular shipping container and you didn't really care what was inside. Now that, that, that absolutely kind of works quite well with software containers. A, a Docker container can run all sorts of applications and we really don't mind what's running inside. Whether it's a modern cloud native Java application, whether it's a legacy .NET 2 framework, a Windows application, we, we honestly don't mind what's inside the container. But the thing is you package it up, you deploy it, you manage it the same way. And so therefore, as you're being start, started to ask to deploy more and more applications and more and more application types, you only have to worry now about one packaging standard, that one packaging standard being the Docker container. And then when you start to look at your infrastructure, all we have to do is understand how to automate and how to deploy these containers. And once you've done that, you can now deploy that same bit of software 
anywhere without custom build scripts, custom deployment scripts, or anything like that. We can use this, this idea of a container to abstract our software away from the infrastructure. Um, at kind of a, a high level, uh, one of the first questions we get asked when we start to talk about containers, uh, is this going to replace my uh, virtualization environment? Is this kind of the new version of virtual machines? Um, and one thing I'll say to that is they are quite different and they're not mutually exclusive. If you try to treat containers like virtual machines, you're going to run into some gotchas pretty quickly. A container is your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run your application all packaged up. We're not packaging up an operating system. We're not packaging up a kernel. It is completely, completely separate. If you picture a, a traditional virtual machine, something you can see like on the far right hand side of this slide, uh, you can see here that the application binaries and OS are all tied together as a single packaging unit. And if you wanted to move that virtual machine around, then you're, you're moving the full operating system with it. A container on the other hand is just the application and the binaries and libraries. So for example, that could be um, the IIS web server layer, and your application content. It could be uh, the Java framework and, and your application. We're not packaging up the operating system and we're not packaging up the kernel. So what that gives us now is a really lightweight artifact. Um, an, an artifact that contains everything required to run your application. You no longer have to move around an instruction manual with your application code because all of the dependencies for your application will be installed inside of that particular container image. Container images often run side by side on the same host. And because of the security processes built in to the operating system, those containers do not see each other. For example, you could be running, I don't know, Java 8 in one container and Java 10 in a second container and there'll be no conflicts, you'll have no problems about interdependencies and, and kind of a, a nightmare trying to upgrade them. They are completely isolated units that can be started and stopped independently, can be running completely different versions, um, but are just sharing the underlying host. Now, a container host could be a physical server, it could be a virtual server, it could be a cloud instance. We honestly don't mind. Um, Obviously, you get a layer of multi-tenancy and isolation as, as part of containerization. So a lot of people uh, ask the question, why do I need a hypervisor and, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, containerization to provide isolation? Can't I do it once? Uh, absolutely, you can. Um, but we often find today when people are starting out with containers and people are starting out with Docker, that they deploy the containers today in a virtual environment. They, they provision a few guest operating systems or cloud instances. Uh, install the Docker engine, and we'll get to that bit in a moment, and then have everything required to start to run uh, their containers. And so kind of then the question becomes, well, what, what benefits does this bring? Like, why, why should I look at Docker? Why should I look at containerization? What am, what am I getting at this? Um, and on this slide, I've, I've split in half. Uh, first, I'm talking about infrastructure. And then secondly, talking a bit about agility. Um, when we look at infrastructure, uh, traditionally today, the way that we've always deployed software, even, uh, even back when we were doing it on physical servers prior to virtualization, you always deployed one application per, per host, one application per physical server, and then it became one application per virtual server. With containerization, because we're able to securely package up and isolate each application, we're able to run more applications per host. Now, this diagram right here shows four uh, applications on, on a single virtual machine, but in the wild, we see people run an awful lot more than that. Um, so the kind of the first benefit you get out of containerization, a consolidation of infrastructure. We see customers kind of consolidate by up to 75% of their virtual estates when they move to containerization. 
Now, there's obviously huge benefits that come from this. You now have reduced your operating system spend. You don't have to license your, your enterprise operating systems as, as much because you're running less virtual machines. You also reduced your operating um, time as well, um, your operating model. You're no longer having to patch all of those virtual machines. You've now got smaller VMs, to uh, less VMs to worry about, therefore less time taken to patch hosts. And then obviously at, at the end of this, we're starting to drive up server utilization. We often see virtual machines being quite highly uh, oversubscribed or over provisioned, sorry. And then when applications are deployed on them, there's an awful lot of idle CPU and idle memory. Because we can start to pack multiple applications per virtual machine, we start to drive up the utilization of your infrastructure. Especially when you start to look in the, the public cloud and, and cloud instance world, where you're actually getting charged per virtual machine, the more applications per virtual machine you can run and the higher utilization, they're all, all real strong, strong perks. Then on the other side, there's also a, a huge agility and um, a benefit that comes to containerization. Because we now have a, 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 a standard packaging unit, we can absolutely reduce the time taken to patch your applications. Um, a, a, and we'll get to it shortly, but a container is actually defined in a clear text file. And all we need to do is just rebuild that container image every time we want to patch it. Let's say you wanted to move from version one to version two of a container. You don't jump into the container and run an upgrade process. All you do is you change your, uh, your instruction file and rebuild. We're now reducing the time taken to patch applications because all we need to do is rebuild once and then redeploy everywhere. And because we have this standard deployment um, uh, artifact, we, we can then reduce the time taken to deploy your applications. One pipeline, one tool set, one set of automation can actually be used to deploy all of, of your uh, application workloads. You no longer have to have separate deployment tools uh, for each, each application. When people start to look at Docker and, and containerization, they also start to look at CICD pipelines. And Docker provides native integration to existing and, and new pipeline tool sets. So as customers start to to create applications or start to move to agile uh, workflows and, and start to develop applications quickly. And they can absolutely include Docker and containers as part of that, whether they're using their pipelines to build uh, container images, using their pipelines to deploy containerized applications. We often see those things come hand in hand. And as I discussed, this is standardization across your application estate, whether it's cloud native applications or legacy applications, both of those are absolutely suited and can run absolutely fine in, in Docker. Uh, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes just talking through some of the traditional common use cases we see for containerization. Uh, other use cases we see for Docker and in include um, integrating as part of a cloud strategy. People use containerization really for, for kind of two, two key, key things on, on, on as part of their cloud strategy. First, uh, as a migration tool, Customers uh, want to find a quicker way to get their applications from the data center into a, into a cloud. Um, and because we talked about the packaging format and the, the speed of deployment, we often see people as part of their migration, migrate their application into a container and then can deploy it anywhere. You don't have to worry about any of the uh, odd deployment scripts in each environment, package it up as a container and you're good to go. At that same time, because containers abstract you away from the infrastructure, they actually prevent you from being locked into a particular cloud. So when customers are starting to look at hybrid cloud or multi-cloud models, um, people use containerization to avoid themselves being locked into a, a, a particular uh, particular platform. Uh, we, we looked at the, the reducing data center expenses. We looked at the infrastructure savings that you can get from moving to containerization, that reduction in, in, in virtual machine infrastructure or server footprint, and the drive up of utilization as we start to run more applications per, per host. Uh, moving to the right hand side of this slide, we can now start to see um, other things, including sort of faster application development and delivery. We see containerization go hand in hand with microservices, cloud native applications, cloud native development, agile development. Um, and so when customers start to look at 
developing software in that way, they would like a standard packaging format for each one of their microservices. And they want those kind of microservices to be integrated into their pipeline. So absolutely, we see people when they start to, to move down uh, that, that agile or, or DevOps frameworks, start to embrace containerization. And, and that really comes hand in hand with, with the mod, uh, modernizing software supply chain. A lot of people today are, are looking for uh, new ways to develop software quicker or distribute software quicker. Um, and so containerization come in with its standard packaging format reduce the time taken to develop software, reduce the time taken to distribute software. Uh, the sixth use case or the bottom use case there on, on the slide is one of the new ones we're starting to see inside of Docker. Um, as people are starting to, to use containerization in the data center, they're wondering if they can start to use some of this technology and some of these benefits on the edge. If they can use or package up their applications using a Docker container and deploy them using standard automation tools, can they use this to start to package up software that they need to distribute out to the edge? We originally kind of saw this on oil rigs and now it started to move across to all sorts of things, sort of cruise ships, manufacturing sites. We're seeing ways that, that people want to start to distribute software out to the edge and a container image and its distribution mechanisms provide a great way of getting software out there. You don't have to now worry about um, kind of releasing your software to all these different environments. You package it up once in the container and then just push it out. And this kind of leads us on to what I say is kind of the vision right now here in Docker. Um, and this is that any app, any operating system, any infrastructure is, is what, we're, what we can containerize. And so you can see the various different application types and going from traditional applications, microservices, COTS applications, blockchain, serverless, whatever it be, all these various different application types that people are now starting to put into containers. And then they use the Docker platform to abstract themselves away from their infrastructure. Whether they're running these applications on cloud, virtual machine, bare metal, even now at the edge, this is kind of the, the goal, I guess, for, for Docker here is, is to package up all these different application types and abstract them away, um, away from, from the infrastructure. The free core design principles, which we also will cover in further on in the webinar series here, is that Docker platform is built on choice, agility, and security. We think that choice is important, whether that's choice around where you run your applications or what applications you want to package up. Um, agility, making sure it's quick and easy to package up your applications and deploy them anywhere. And security is key. We're, we're introducing new packaging formats, new levels of multi-tenancy. We need to make sure security is inbuilt by default in all of, all of our platforms. Cool. All right, I'm just going to uh, stop here and quickly have a look to see if there are any questions that are pop through into the panel. Oh, there's quite a few. Um, uh, the kind of question, is the Docker engine a kind of hypervisor? Uh, great question. I'm actually going to come back a little bit around um, what the Docker engine is and where it sits in the stack uh, as we kind of go through this next session. So hopefully we'll, this will answer some of those, those uh, original questions. Um, so the diagram we showed before, VMs versus containers. A, a container is just your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run your application. Uh, all running on a shared uh, operating system. This diagram is actually slightly incorrect. The Docker engine is actually not in the IO path of your application. The Docker engine, as you can see in, in this diagram, is actually used to create, start, and stop containers. Once a container has been started, the Docker engine is completely out of the way. There is no performance overhead when containerizing an application. It's not like a hypervisor where you're running a full guest operating system. Therefore, there is added latency and, and, and CPU and, and memory constraints. Um, your application is, in theory, just running natively on the box. The Docker engine creates the container and then gets out of the way. It is, it is not in, in the IO path at all. So one of the then kind of questions that, that come up is, well, what, what is this idea of a container image? how do I build a container image? How do I get my application in into a container? Um, and when, when you kind of think about what, what you're actually doing here, 
you're actually running your application in its own isolated file system. It's uh, actually running kind of isolated away from the host. Each container has its own isolated root file system. They don't share them. Um, hence, that gives us an element of isolation. So how do you get your application into a container? All we really have to do is install it in that in that in that in that uh, that root file system. Uh, the way that we actually do this um, is is actually through something we call a Docker file. Now, a Docker file is an instruction set on how to define a container image. A, a Docker file lives um, normally in source control. Normally lives actually alongside your application. So if your application lived in like a, 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 a some sort of source control repository, a Docker file would live there too. And the Docker file basically defines how to build a root file system containing that application. Remember, we're not packaging up the host, we're not packaging up the kernel, we're not packaging up the networking stack. We're just copying the application into its into its file system. So just kind of like a, some simple instructions here, I, I've kind of said, well, what file system do I want to start from? And you could start from anything. And in this situation, I've actually started from um, a really lightweight Linux distribution called Alpine. I've started there. That's going to be my root file system. Uh, I'm actually going to install a package from the package manager of, of this, this Linux distribution. The package I'm going to install is Nginx. So I, I now have a, a web server running inside of that file system. Um, I'm going to copy across my application code. So this is the bit that gets my application from uh, the uh, the, the, the building machine, wherever you build your container images, into the file system. So I'm just going to copy it from there into a container. And then a quick entry point that says when this container gets deployed, just start Nginx. Now, this bit of clear text is pretty simple. Everybody can collaborate with it. We can kind of see exactly how a container image is built. Um, and all we're really doing now is copying that application inside. Now, you could could compile your application inside the file system. You could download it. There's many different ways for you to get that application in there. Uh, this is a very, very simple web service. So I've literally just copied it. I don't know how to do any kind of installation or anything like that. Um, then the kind of question comes, well, if I wanted to patch my application, pretty simple. I go back to my, my, my Docker file, and I would change things. Let's say I wanted to use a new version of, of Alpine. Simple. I just change my from line to a new version and rebuild. I, I don't go into the container and do an update. I don't uh, kind of run a, an, an update agent inside or anything like that. I just I come back to my Docker file, change a simple line, and then rebuild. If a developer has made a change to the My Website code, fair enough. All we have to do is rerun this, this um, Docker file again. It will copy in the new version of my site into the container image, and I now have a new one to distribute around. One of the core concepts of Docker and one of the core concepts of containerization is this layer in the stack called a container runtime. In that previous diagram, the Docker engine was the container runtime. Um, and the container runtime runs natively on your host, whether it's a Linux host or a Windows host. Um, as we kind of talked about, we're not packaging up the operating system. We're actually running the application natively on the operating system. Um, so uh, we only really support the modern hosts there. So Linux, Windows, uh, primarily running on x86 or um, uh, things like ARM as well. Um, the Docker engine's job is simple. It starts containers, it stops containers, and it gives you a bit of access to container logs and, and, and maybe a shell prompt in a container image. Um, it's not in the IO path. It's not doing any of the, the kind of communication between two containers or anything like that. That's all being done on the host. Um, the communication between the container and the kernel all being done by the host. We're, we're not in the IO path. Uh, because that point, um, Linux containers have to run on a Linux host. Windows containers have to run on a Windows host. When we're, we're not providing any kind of uh, uh, encapsulation or anything like that. So if you started a Windows application in a container on a Linux host, the first thing it's going to say is, well, where's the Windows kernel? Um, so yep, uh, that, that's kind of one of the things. And then the other part, so the container runtime manages containers. It also handles images. 
the Docker engine's job is to pull images down from the internet or from a, a registry. Uh, it's to extract them and it's to build new ones. When we get to the demonstration in a moment, um, you will see that the Docker engine's job here uh, will be to, to build uh, container images. Cool. Let's quickly jump to a demonstration. Okay, so I'm now uh, on my laptop. And on my laptop, I'm actually running um, a, a, a product that Docker has uh, announced in December called Docker Desktop Enterprise. There is a Docker Desktop Community Edition as well, uh, but this is our enterprise version, which gives you centralized management and, and kind of a fully supported um, development environment. This bit of software now enables me to run containers locally on my Windows 10 machine. So uh, I've got Docker Desktop running. I have on my laptop a Docker file. So a Docker file, as we just talked about, clear text, pretty straightforward. I'm actually here, I'm going to start from Alpine uh, Lightweight Linux distribution, and I'm just going to copy application code from my laptop into that container file system. Really kind of uh, simple, kind of one of the, the more basic Docker files you'll see. Um, but it kind of shows the concept, right? We'll start from Alpine and we'll copy our application inside. To turn that bit of clear text and my application, which is just sat here running in my directory, into a container image, we need to talk to the Docker engine. Pretty simple command, docker build. We're going to call it, um, I don't know, webinar demo version one, and off we go. Now, that was actually using some cached content, so it's pretty quick. But all we've done there is we uh, open up the, the temporary file system, copied across our application code, and um, ready, ready to go. To start a container, pretty straightforward again. So Docker container run. Um, I'm actually going to expose the firewall of a container so I can access it from my laptop. It's kind of like a, a software firewall between each container. I want to punch a hole in it so that I can access the container's web server. And a webinar, webinar demo one. Cool. Great. So the container image you've just seen me built have now gone, OK, I want you to start it as a container. The container runtime, in this case, the Docker engine, please take the container image you just saw me build and run it on my laptop. So it's a web server. Browse to the web server port. Perfect. There we go. You can now see that I have a pretty simple web server. Uh, this one actually just displaying cat GIFs because, you know, it's the internet. Um, running locally on my laptop. I'm now a developer. I've containerized my application. I run it locally. OK. The next question, I guess, is, all right, a developer, I package up my application. I run it locally, a quick smoke test. It works. How do I now distribute my container out to the, to the world? Pretty simple. So I'm going to rename my container image from uh, webinar one. Um, to uh, a, a, a container registry. Uh, that's the name of my container registry. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to take the container image that I've just built on my machine and send that container image off to a, off to a centralized store. If a developer containerizes an application locally, well, that's great. But how does he get that to the data center? How does he get that to a public cloud? The distribution mechanism around containers involves registries. Um, and here you've seen I've just taken the container image and pushed it upwards. A quick look inside of a container registry now. Quick refresh. We can now can see the tag one got pushed there um, 20 seconds ago, and it's 20 meg in size. Imagine trying to distribute a virtual machine like that, right? You have to take like an ISO or a VMDK or something and, and trying to get that around. A container image is so lightweight that we can just push it around. And I've not had to, to worry about any. Um, just to kind of prove, well, what happens now, if, if I uh, jump onto a second server, in this case, uh, a jump box server running, uh, running in the cloud and try and start the same container, uh, Uh, 
um, you can see the first thing it's done is it said, well, I'm unable to find that container image locally. It doesn't exist in my jump box. I've, I've just built it on my laptop. So it's gone out to the uh, to my registry. It's gone out to here and said, I'm going to download this. It's downloaded it. It's extracted it and it started it for us. Now hitting the same port on my jump box. Bingo, there we go. I can see um, I, I have uh, the web server running there. It was that quick and easy to take an application, containerize it locally, test that it runs, push it to a shared store, and now run it on a second server. That's the kind of the power of abstracting your application away uh, from its infrastructure. And on that second server, you didn't see me installing anything. You didn't see me installing the web server, installing Java, installing Python. It's like it, it was all inside of the container image. OK. Um, so that kind of moves me on to the next question. Well, what happens if I have multiple containers and multiple uh, hosts? Running one container on one server is great. Like that, that, that's wonderful. However, realistically, in my enterprise, I've got, I don't know, 200, 500, 1,000 applications, and I have a, a fleet of, of, of virtual machines. How do I start to manage containers or schedule containers at a higher up level? Um, and this is the world now of a container orchestrator. Um, just to make sure we're all clear, some, some popular container orchestrators include things like Docker Swarm, uh, include things like Kubernetes. Uh, they're probably the two closest, as, uh, two firms ahead as market leaders, but there are a few more out there in the industry. A container orchestrator's job is now to sit above all of these container runtimes, so all of these Docker engines and all of these uh, virtual machines, and start to schedule containers across them all. If a new developer comes online and says, hey, I, I want to run my web server somewhere, um, he will now talk to the container orchestrator and say, hey, I want to run one instance of my cat demo. He doesn't have to know if there's free resources available on the environment. The container orchestrator's first job will be, well, this one's got 10 containers, this one's got 10 containers, that one's got nine. Oh, great, I found some room. I'm going to schedule the cat, server, uh, cat web server uh, over here. Perfect. That's kind of the first job of a container orchestrator. It now provides a scheduling across multiple Docker engines. It also handles resource management. So when we start to allocate resources to containers, and, and you can do, you can say this web, uh, this web server needs so much memory and so much CPU, all of that can be taken into account when scheduling. Even, for example, if you had things like uh, schedule this workload on a server with encrypted disks and a GPU inside, that as well could be could be included in kind of the scheduling decision. You no longer now have to worry about where your applications run. You just tell the orchestrator to do it, and it will it will find somewhere to run your application. The orchestrator also comes with a self-healing element. They actually are now starting to move to uh, distributed systems. Orchestrators are declarative, and they start to run control loops. And what I mean by that is, if you say, hey, Mr. Orchestrator, I would like to run one web server, um, it will deploy it on your environment, and then it will keep checking back in to make sure that web server is running. It will come back, check back in and say, hey, is that web server still running, yes or no? If it's not running for whatever reason, it will reschedule it. And then finally, an orchestrator has an idea of service management. Someone needs to keep track of where all these applications are running, where all these containers are deployed. The days of someone having to manually update a spreadsheet every time a new application is deployed goes away because the container orchestrator now keeps track of where the application is running and how to get traffic to it. A lot of people now want to start to build on top of a container orchestrator. And when you start to bring container orchestrators into your into your enterprise, into your companies, there's often more tools that people need, need to actually start to operate containers. Primarily, people at this point will bring in a management layer, and they would bring in a container registry. Um, and we start to call this now a container as a service platform. 
where we start to bring all the required tools in to operate a container runtime, a container orchestrator inside of your environment. Um, and that's exactly what the Docker Enterprise container platform is. So if you ever see the concept of Docker Enterprise as part of this series or as part of any of the other material that, that Docker produce, um, this is our container as a service platform. Um, it can run on any infrastructure, whether that's physical, virtual, on-premise, off-premise, uh, we honestly don't mind. Can run Linux workloads or Windows workloads, absolutely, we honestly don't mind. Um, we bring in our container runtime, and now this is a hardened, secured version of our container runtime, our, our enterprise distribution, if you will. Uh, we bring in two supported orchestrators. We bring in Docker Swarm mode and we bring in Kubernetes, the open source community project. Um, so if you wanted to schedule your containers via either one, not a problem. Docker Enterprise manages both of those orchestrators and provides um, access to the APIs for you. And then finally on the top, we bring in a control plane and a registry. Uh, the control plane, uh, the control plane provides this now management user interface on top, right? Containers are pretty CLI driven and pretty kind of like, uh, it's quite a bit of a learning curve to understand how to deploy containers and, and manage them. The control plane now provides a central point for you to, to really deploy containers, grab the logs, grab the metrics um, and manage your applications. We now provide like basically a cluster management functionality on top of the orchestrator. The control plane is the place in the stack that manages Kubernetes and manages Docker Swarm. And it can also provide sort of enterprise features like role-based access control, uh, centralized logging, and centralized monitoring. Uh, the Docker Trusted Registry um, is that, that, that enterprise container registry that you saw me use inside of my demonstration. When I wanted to get my application from my laptop, to a, a VM running in the cloud, I needed a central artifact store. The Docker Trusted Registry is that central artifact store, and we build on top of it with enterprise features like scanning images for vulnerabilities, uh, signing images to, to kind of say who's built them and who's seen them. So really kind of locking down um, what developers, uh, what container images developers can use. And we can also provide things like uh, re image replication and mirroring. So if you if you had, know, had two sites, you would push your images to one registry and we'd take care of replicating them and mirroring them off to a second registry. So you can start to see here that these are kind of enterprise features built on top of container orchestrators, container runtimes um, on top of your underlying infrastructure. Uh, the, the enterprise container platform is just one part of the wider, I guess, Docker, uh, I guess, product um, vision. And you can start to see here the end-to-end -end journey from a developer running on his desktop using the desktop enterprise product that you, you saw me uh, use to build my container image locally, distribute the container image through the Docker trusted registry. And in a moment, you can see me deploy it onto the universe control plane. A true end-to-end -end journey from a developer developing an application to an operator running the application in production. Um, and as, as we kind of talked about, the three core pillars of our platform, choice, security, and agility. The next webinars in this series will be dedicated to each one of these pillars. So we'll dive qu uh, deeper into choice and have a look at the, any application, any infrastructure uh, uh, aspect of running containers. We'll have a look at security in terms of locking down container images. And then in the, in the fourth webinar, we'll have a look at agility and trying to understand how our containers can speed up application deployment and application patching. Uh, if you guys weren't aware, for, there's, there's obviously some analysts out there in the industry. Forrester recently released a report to say how, what's the enterprise container platform market look like. And as you can see here, Docker in, in the top right hand corner is a strong leader in this space, providing a secure way to run containers uh, in the enterprise. Cool. Now, just before I finish, um, I just wanted to have a quick demonstration of showing what, what an application deployed by a container orchestrator will look like. Um, just one final demonstration. So you, you saw my, um, my cat web server. 
if I wanted now to deploy this on to multiple servers and deploy this at, uh, across our environment, we need to deploy it on a container orchestrator. Um, at this point, I'm going to actually define my application as something called a service. Now, a service provides um, this abstraction. I'm now telling the container orchestrator, I would like two instances of my web server, go away and, and deploy them. This is the universal control plane. This is the management control plane as part of the Docker enterprise. And if I jump in here and say, I would like to deploy a new stack, a new application, a webinar demonstration, put it on Kubernetes and just deploy my application. So the container image you just saw me build, expose it on this internet, uh, on this port, and I would like two copies. That That is the simple instruction we're telling the orchestrator. Kubernetes, go and find a place to run two containers uh, uh, using this image. Off you go. I, I don't care where they run, you schedule them wherever is best, wherever available resources, and off we go. A quick check now, and, and hopefully a couple of seconds, we should see uh, this deploying. A couple of seconds. Um, cool. Good. Um, yep, we're now starting to see, oh, actually we've got an error. Okay, I'll have to go and look at that one in a second. But yeah, we can now start to see how, how Kubernetes has taken my application, it's taken my deployment artifact, and it's deployed it cluster-wide. I no longer have to worry about managing individual containers on individual hosts. I can manage it centrally via a control plane. Well, that's it from, from my side. That's it from the, the content. I wanted to kind of give you guys a, a, an overview of, of what containers are, some common use cases of containers. Look at exactly what a container runtime is. Look at exactly what a container orchestrator is. And then introduce you to the Docker Enterprise Container Platform. As we go forward now in this webinar series, we will cover each of those pillars in more detail. Then deep dive onto Kubernetes and then finally look at modernizing traditional applications um, inside of, of, of Docker Enterprise. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm now gonna work my way through uh, the questions in the chat. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. Okay, we will now open things up for Q&A. We do have our Docker expert online here, Robert Freeman, to take those questions. Robert? Thanks. Um, so there's, I, I've been kind of answering as we as we went, um, but you know with a, with a thousand folks, we we've had a lot of questions. So uh, I'm gonna kind of hit um, a couple things that are that haven't been addressed yet, uh, as well as some things that I've seen a, a lot of questions about. Um, you know, the first one is uh, Windows and Linux. You know, can you run containers uh, run a Linux container on Windows or or vice versa? Um, so you you cannot natively run uh, a Linux container on Windows or a Windows container on Linux. Since they're sharing the kernel, uh, they need a, a, a compatible kernel to be able to uh, be able to run that app. So if you wanted to run a Windows app, you need to be able to expose to a Windows kernel. Um, the one question that I got was sort of related to this was uh, what commonly referred to as LCALs or Linux container on Windows. That is something that Windows has demonstrated a couple times. Uh, they made a meal in beta, and that uses their uh, Hyper-V hypervisor uh, to create a really lightweight uh, VM uh, and then put it a so lightweight Linux VM and then put a Linux container in it. So it is it is containers sort of since there is a container, but there is some overhead with the uh, with the Hyper-V um, uh, VM that, that it's sitting on. Uh, so while you can do that, it is not supported by Windows yet uh, by Microsoft yet. Uh, we'll see whether whether that comes out. You know, it's it's been a, around for quite a while and, and there hasn't been a ton of progress on it. But so you would need to run the uh, you know Linux Linux hosts that are running your Linux workloads and Windows hosts that are running your uh, Windows workloads. I had a question about is Kubernetes uh, installed on Docker by default? The answer is yes. Uh, when you stand up a swarm um, or a cluster uh, with Docker, uh, it automatically creates uh, also a uh, Kubernetes cluster and a swarm, and both components run on all of the 
uh, various hosts uh, and, and provide UX to that. And you can either dictate, I only want to use this orchestrator, or I only want to use that orchestrator, or you can let them use either. Just something to be aware of on that is because they are not aware of each other, uh, any resource constraints that are established, uh, you know, could be cross crossed. You could say, hey, there's eight cores here, so I'm going to give this app five uh, via Kubernetes, I'm going to give this other app five via Swarm, uh, and then, you know, there's only eight to go around, but they're trying to address ten, so uh, that'll that'll create a uh, conflict and a, and a performance issue. Um, the other question I, I got is that there will be, um, where does Compose come in? Uh, Compose is uh, kind of a set of uh, specs or parameters that allow you to communicate with the orchestrator, whether that be Swarm or Kubernetes, uh, and allow you to kind of dictate the configuration or the statefulness of the app. So uh, the Docker file is to one uh, container as the Compose is to the app. So if you have, it'll, you know, stand up your, your database and your, your web front end and maybe your RESTful API and you can configure that all in the Compose file, how they're networked together, how they're exposed, what labels and constraints you want to put them either from a resource perspective. Um, that is how you uh, use Compose and that's how it kind of fits in the, uh, the medium. If you've ever used uh, YAML, uh, Kubernetes YAML file, uh, it, is, it is sort of a more human readable version uh, of that. Uh, it looks like we're kind of running out of time. Uh, there is a recording that will be sent out in the next 48 hours. I uh, appreciate you guys coming on um, and uh, hope to see you on uh, some of the other webinars here coming up in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. This does conclude the webinar. Um, as Robert said, a reminder that today's session was being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email to be the recording in about 48 hours. Also, since we had such great questions today, we are going to follow up with a blog post to summarize the questions asked. Um, we apologize for the technical difficulties experienced at the top of the webinar. Uh, appreciate you sticking with us and thank you again for joining us and look forward to seeing you at the next Docker seminar. Thank you and have a great day.